Hello, and welcome to this week's Green Bank Observatory community webinar. Uh, I'm Jay Lockman. I'm sitting in for the director, Jim Jackson, who's on vacation today. And I will just give a few brief comments and then turn, um, turn this uh, session over to our speaker. Um, can I get a, this to actually move? Hmm, all right. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Oh, there we go. Um, right now, I just want to remind everyone that the GBT is operating on its summer maintenance schedule, and this is how it looks uh, through September. We will have some overnight shutdowns uh, through August, and then into September, you see from the 12th to the 29th, they'll be shut down for track and grout work. Um, and Drift scans will be available at this time only overnight. So at the end of September, we'll resume full operations. Also, as you may know, we had a problem with the GBT prime focus boom. Uh, it was out of operation for a few weeks. Here on the left, you see the GBT arm with the receiver room and the prime focus boom. And on the right, you see the boom here extended in front of the subreflector. Well, the boom had a, a problem with its mechanism and we had to get spare, uh, order new parts to fix it. Uh, the parts should be arriving soon uh, until it gets repaired, which right now looks to be during the grout work on the track at the end of September. No prime focus receivers are available and there will be no receiver changes. The suite of receivers that are in the receiver room now are those we will be operating with through September. We hope that everything will be back to normal by the end of September and we can resume normal operations at that point. Uh, we had a call for proposals for the 22A semester a few weeks ago. 74 proposals were received. They are currently being reviewed for technical and scientific uh, merit. And the uh, Telescope Allocation Committee will meet in mid-October, 17th to 18th, and the results of the proposal call should be announced sometime in early November. That's all I had. And so let me now introduce our, oops, what's going on here? Let me introduce our speaker for today. Okay, um, <laughs> all right. Let me introduce our speaker for today. Ash K. Suresh is a PhD student at Cornell University and he is going to be speaking on a galactic center search for transients, fast transients from four to eight gig gigahertz. Um, let me remind everyone that this session is being recorded for later viewing. And uh, if you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A button on the lower right of your screen. Take it away, Akshay. Thank you very much, Jay. Let me share my screen. Looks good? Yes. All right. Yeah, thanks everyone for attending. Today, I'm excited to discuss results from a four to eight gigahertz survey of the Galactic Center for Fast Transients. Here's my talk outline. I'll first motivate why the Galactic Center is an interesting place to look for transients, particularly pulsars. I'll quickly discuss our observations undertaken with the Green Bank Telescope. I'll then move on to our results, emphasizing their physical significance. Finally, I'll leave you with the key takeaways from my talk. The Galactic Center, particularly its inner few parsec, is home to a large population of massive stars. When these stars collapse, they leave behind compact stellar remnants such as neutron stars and black holes. Leveraging multivalent constraints on the known neutron star population, Morton et al. predict that the inner parsec of our galaxy alone must host about 1,000 active pulsars beaming towards the Earth. And with the high stellar density there, one could very well find a pulsar black hole binary that has eluded detection so far. Why is this important? That's because pulsars are precise astrophysical plots. And by recording pulse arrival times at the Earth, 
We can infer properties of a binary companion if present. Consider a pulsar orbiting Sag A star, the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. By pulsar timing, you can measure the black hole properties. Further, you can test theories of gravity in the strong field regime. Finally, using pulse propagation effects such as dispersion and scattering, you can probe the ionized central ISM. Let me illustrate the power of pulsar timing with some numbers. Our current best estimate of the mass of Sag A star comes from the orbit of the star S2, the 16-year orbit, which you see on the right. And the, you notice that we know the mass of Sag A star up to about 1,000 solar mass precision. With pulsar timing, you can bring this number down to 1 to 10 solar masses, and that would be an incredible feat. On the left, I show you the fractional mass precision you can accomplish with pulsar timing as a function of the binary orbital period and the various colored curves correspond to different pulsar timing delays. Notice that even for a binary orbital period of a year, you can achieve precisions much better than what we have so far today. On the right, we show you the precisions that can be accomplished or achieved on the fra fractional precisions on the black hole spin and quadrupole moment. The dashed line shows estimates for the VLA, but the VLA when phased up has a collecting area equivalent to that of the GBT. So the GBT should enable exciting science as well for galactic center pulsars. With such a rich array of rewards on offer, what have past surveys of the galactic center uncovered so far? The answer is one magneta and five pulsars. On the right, I show you the spatial distribution of these objects with Sag A star in the center of the figure. Notice that all known pulsars shown as black diamonds are at least 10 arc minutes away from Sag A star. In contrast, we have one magnetar within 2.4 arc minutes of Sag A star. And so this raises the question. We have a dearth of pulsars near the galactic center, but we do have a magnetar. Does that mean um, the massive stars preferentially produce magnetars at the galactic center? That's one theory. Alternately, there may be challenges to galactic center pulsar discovery that we have not fully addressed previously. Let us discuss some of those. I like to divide these pulsar search challenges into chromatic and achromatic effects. Coming to chromatic effects, pulsars are brighter at lower radio frequencies. So if you want to detect brighter pulsar emission, you go, go down the frequency axis. However, as you move towards lower radio frequencies, scattering gets stronger, the galactic background temperature increases, and you also have increased free-free absorption from the ionized gas between us and any pulsar at the galactic center. So considering various chromatic effects, Rajwade et al. recommended 9 to 13 gigahertz as the optimal band for galactic center pulsar discovery. However, pulsar emission shows variable spectral indices with a broad range, the spectral index being on average minus 1.4 plus or minus one. And that means there's a lot of slop in the recommended observing band and broadband observations above a gigahertz are essential to uncover elusive galactic center pulsars. Coming to achromatic effects, orbital motion is an important consideration. Here, as an illustration, I just show you a cartoon where we are observing an isolated pulsar. The power spectrum of its d-dispersed time series shows a regular sequence of harmonics, a finite number of them. Standard periodicity searches sum the power across these harmonics to improve the detection significance. What happens if we have orbital motion? Orbital motion introduces a time-dependent Doppler drift that smears harmonics in the power spectrum. And this smearing is proportional to the harmonic number. So in an extreme scenario where the orbital motion is really fast, you could have all the higher harmonics smeared away and only the fundamental left. And that would be the most extreme scenario of pulsar detection with fast orbital motion. Existing pulsar search techniques attempt to retroactively correct for Doppler smearing, assuming a constant or a linearly evolving line of sight pulsar acceleration. With this information in hand, what sort of observations have we undertaken? Our observations were taken as part of the Breakthrough Listen Galactic Center survey, targeting a variety of science cases, including techno signatures, pulsars, spectral lines, and masers. The survey, when complete, will cover a broad range of frequencies extending from 700 megahertz all the way to 93 gigahertz. The low frequency portion of the survey will be done at the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia, whereas the Green Bank Telescope will be used for the high frequency portion from 4 to 93 gigahertz. 
I'll be focusing on the four to eight gigahertz portion of the survey for, the, for this talk. The four to eight gigahertz pointing strategy is simple. With a beam size of about 2.5 arc minutes at six gigahertz, we tile the central six arc minute of our galaxy with 19 pointings as shown in the right figure. Now the, our central pointing, which we call A00, contains a galactic center magnetar, and we perform multiple 30 minute integrations on our central pointing. In addition, we supplement these with three five minute on off pointings on each of the remaining uh, pointings in the sky. Now, our data processing me method is standard. We perform Fourier domain periodicity searches, incorporating a constant or a linearly changing radial pulsar acceleration. As a first test, what, uh, what, do, what does our survey find? What should our survey find? One is we need to see the magnetar in our central pointing. So let me give you an expectation for the survey. Here is a survey sensitivity plot. And in the plot that you see, the background scatter is the known pulsar population. Herein, I assume that the galactic center pulsar population follows similar demographics as that seen in the galactic field. We, are, we should be able to detect all pulsars that we see above this black line for a pulse duty cycle of 2.5%. At the lowest periods, we are limited by scattering below 1.4 milliseconds. And notice that the galactic center magnetar should be easily detectable in our survey. How does our survey compare to past efforts? Here is the answer. At the highest, at the longest periods, our survey represents a 20% improvement in sensitivity. Keep in mind that the y-axis is a log scale. And coming to the shorter periods, we have a substantial gain in sensitivity. And particularly, our survey opens a window of discovery towards superluminous MSPs that were previously not accessible. However, a substantial fraction of MSPs still remain below our sensitivity threshold, and that might be a concern. Now, we certainly see that the galactic center magnetar should be detected as our survey passed the first test. Yes, and convincingly. On the left, I show you the detection of the galactic center magnetar in the power spectrum, and you can see a finite number of regularly spaced harmonics. On the right, I show you a sy typical single pulse of the galactic center magnetar, which comprises of two marginally resolved subpulses. These subpulses have opposing spectral indices between 5 to 8 gigahertz. The leading subpulse on the left is brighter at the top of the band, whereas the trailing subpulse on the right is brightest in the middle of our band. We have an issue with our band pass below 5 gigahertz, so we've discarded that for subsequent analysis. Coming to our pulsar searches, we set a six sigma detection criterion and we found reported a non-detection of pulsars in our survey. Let me illustrate, let me show you our pulsar search candidates. On the left, I show you the spatial distribution of our survey pointings. A00 is our central pointing, which contains the galactic center magnetar, and around it we have the B and C rings. We color code these candidates in these different pointings, and on the right is their statistical distribution in the period dispersion measure plane. The galactic center magnetar markedly stands out as a cluster of A00 candidates that are not seen across any of the other beams. Notice that we have a horizontal scatter of candidates between two to 100 milliseconds seen across all of the pointings. And usually candidates that are seen across multiple non-adjacent pointings, we flag those as interference, radio frequency interference or RFI an example of which I've highlighted on the figure. Looking at the can looking at remaining candidates, uh, such as streaks of A00 candidates that you see at various periods, we looked at their pulse profiles and traced them to interference that were missed by a data flagging procedure. And so the only astrophysical object of interest that was uncovered in our survey was the galactic center magnetar. Hence, we again have a non-detection of galactic center pulsars in our survey. Does this mean we have a missing pulsar problem at the galactic center? I would say it's still too early to conclude that. The galactic center is a region with really high stellar density. And we know that globular clusters also have high stellar densities. The ele elevated stellar densities there favors millisecond pulsar production. And as we've seen earlier, our sensitivity curves tell us that we are not quite as sensitive to millisecond pulsars. And that is something to look upon in future surveys. Secondly, we've continued to use a simple 
constant or linearly changing acceleration assumption in our periodicity searches. And that might not hold true for complex pulsar dynamics possible at the galactic center, such as hyperbolic orbits resulting from encounters with neutron stars and black holes at the galactic center, alternately variable, highly eccentric orbits with fast orbital motion, wherein a simple constant acceleration assumption may not hold true. So to summarize, we have a non-detection of galactic center pulsars in our survey above a six sigma detection criterion. We do convincingly detect the galactic center magnetar in our survey. Avenues for future exploration include enabling greater sensitivity to millisecond pulsars and probing the MSP population at the galactic center, and further using more uh, full orbit de demodulation techniques to look for potentially complicated dynamics of pulsars at the galactic center. With that, I thank you all for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, let me remind everyone to submit questions through the Q&A button on the lower right of the screen. Um, what can you, can you briefly explain why the shorter period pulsars, why you're less sensitive to the shorter period pulsars than the longer ones? That's a great question. So when you have scattering, scattering asymmetrically broadens pulses. So let me go up to one of my backup uh, slides. I think you just answered the question. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'll just share. Sure. The scattering broadens pulses. And if the pulses get smeared into the continuum, you cannot detect them. So you see that as you move towards shorter and shorter periods, scattering becomes more dominant. And here I've assumed the scattering law for the galactic center magnetar, which sets this odd cutoff at 1.4 milliseconds. We don't know of any other objects in the galactic center using which we can measure scattering. So more estimates would be useful. One major concern that has been raised previously is that the galactic center magnetar just represents one line of sight. And we may have to potentially consider multiple lines of sight with different scattering measures or scattering time scales. And that's an unknown in, for most galactic center surveys. Okay, we have an, uh, a question. Um, in an early slide, you showed other pulsars around the vicinity of the galactic center. Um, is the assumption that those are mostly foreground? No, that's a good question. So these are too far. I would answer. I would put it this way: these are too far away for the benefits, full benefits of pulsar timing, to come into effect. So. The main benefits of pulsar timing that I highlighted was to measure the black hole properties and test general relativity in the strong field regime. And the pulsars are just too far away for us to be able to do that kind of science. But by far away, you mean in um, horizontal displacement. Are they approximately at the distance of the galactic center? No, these are, uh, we, we don't, for some of these pulsars, we don't have a distance estimate yet, but at least there are 10 arc minutes away in projection. So mm -hmm. um, at least in projection, they're really far away. Okay, okay. Um, there's another question. Could a method like transit or some type of gravitational lensing of the galactic center supermassive black hole, um, at, such as used for exoplanet discovery, be used for potential pulsar detection? That's an interesting question. But how would you detect a transit here? Because for a transit, you're trying to look at a pulsar. I'm trying to understand what would be the background object in front of which a pulsar might pass through. Are you referring to the pulsar passing through an accretion disk of the black hole or? Or even I, I, I believe lensing by the black hole. Lensing by the black hole. One possible source of confusion here might be if you have a lot of neutron stars and black holes, it can be hard to disentangle images from one another. That would be one consideration. And secondly, I'm not sure if the lensing geometries would line up correctly for various black, uh, pulsars, like many of these pulsars and are often in really dense environments. And so, they frequently undergo exchanges. So it's hard to predict with the dynamics involved if lensing could be a factor, at least of, as of now, but I'm really open to the discussion. It's an interesting idea. Okay, so another question. Uh, 
what did the uh, signal to noise level that you detect on the magnetar imply about whether you should have detected other pulsars at the same distance, given some sort of assumption on their luminosity? In other words, in general terms, how sensitive was your study? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the, this figure that I'm showing you right now tells you about the theoretical survey sensitivity limit. And we do detect the magnetar, which is um, far above a theoretical survey sensitivity limit. And so pulsars with similar luminosities or uh, luminosities comparable to the magnetar should be detectable. A true measure of our survey sensitivity comes when you inject fake pulsars into your data and try to recover them. And there, red noise limits the survey sensitivity at longer periods. So that's an excellent question. Let me move to one of my backup slides. So here is just an example. So I tried injecting pulsars at different duty cycles with various periods and luminosities. And this red curve shows our limiting sensitivity. So if you can see, we are limited. So red noise for various duty cycles, it progressively limits pulsar detection at longer periods. And that's something we cannot fully correct for in our data. So all the other pulsars that are above these dotted lines for different duty cycles, you can convincingly detect in your survey. It's, I, I had a question about your actual uh, measurement technique. How long did you spend integrating at each location? Yeah, so that's a, another good question. So the integration time is depending dependent on the pointing. So if I go back, so for all pointings, for pointing directly at the galactic center, we have 13 minute integrations. And for those outside, we have five minute integrations. So um, does your sensitivity go down as the root of the integration time? Yes, it does. So it does go down as a root of the integration time, provided you're working with clean patches of data where there's not much RFI or mm -hmm. uh, any kind of pulsar signal. So you really do have, I mean, 30 minutes is not that much time. You really do have uh, the option to go quite a bit deeper, at least on a, uh, in selected areas. Correct, we do, but we have to keep in mind one concern, so which is orbital motion. So the assumption of, say, a constant acceleration is valid only if the duration of your observation spans a very short fraction of the orbital period. Mm -hmm. So typically, uh, for orbital time, orbital, let me put it this way. So if your observing fraction is less than 10% of your orbital period, the assumption of a constant acceleration is valid. And so for looking at really compact binaries, you want to go to shorter integrations, but then to build up signal to noise, you want longer integrations. So there's a trade-off there. And you did say that you were exploring uh data analysis techniques that involve jerk and other higher order terms of the uh, velocity? Uh, jerk is already included and jerk lets you just increase the ratio of the allowed integration time to the orbital period to greater than 15%, but more complicated techniques would be to correct for the, to fully remove the phase of the motion through a full orbit demodulation technique. And that's been previously done by the Einstein at home collaboration. However, for circular orbits, now we need to account for potentially highly eccentric orbits as well as part of these searches. Okay. And we had a, a viewer that wanted to be reminded of why you were uh, limiting your observations to frequencies above five gigahertz and not lower. Yeah, so about five gigahertz is primarily due to, uh, to account for, uh, to limit scattering being an effect towards the galactic center and also not have to deal with the galactic background temperature below 500 megahertz or below 300 megahertz particularly. So that's the main reason why for pulsar searching, we are focusing on frequencies above four gigahertz. Okay, uh, I don't, oh, here's, uh, here comes a question. Does your work allow you to derive any conclusion about the galactic center excess, also known as the Fermi GEV excess? Yeah, that's a great question. So to my knowledge, there are two leading theories for the GEV excess. One is dark matter annihilation, and the second is the millisecond pulsar population at the galactic center. 
And right now, since we are not sensitive to most of the MSPs, we can't produce a strong constraint on the GEV excess. Okay. Well, there are no more open questions. So I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation today and remind everyone that this is being recorded and will be available for viewing through the greenbankobservatory.org website uh, very shortly. Please join us two weeks from now when we'll have a presentation by Jack Orlowski Scherer, Constraints on the Thermodynamic State of X-ray Bubbles in the Cluster MS0735 with the Mustang II instrument on the Green Bank Telescope. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you. <laughs>